Lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash, live, safe, and sound back in England. Jacob, one of the believers, had the question about is it okay to take karate or not? Karate, which originated in Okinawa in 1507, did not start out as a religion, but rather was hijacked by a Shaolin monk in 1527. What are your thoughts on defending yourself and martial arts? Concerning self-defense, we must not mistake what Jesus taught about turning the other cheek with not defending oneself. Jesus said if someone knew at what hour the thief was going to come, he'd protect his house. And he also, at one place, although it had a spiritual meaning of the Old and New Testament, he said to take two swords. It's as the Lord leads in a given situation. It depends on the situation. Not turning the other cheek meant not returning evil for evil. It was not a polemic or a biblical injunction against self-defense. Now, concerning martial arts, it becomes more problematic. As you say, what began or may have begun as a form of simple self-defense in Okinawa was hijacked by Eastern religion and the Australian monk. The Israelis have a form of self-defense called Krav Maga. Krav Maga. It uses many of the techniques employed in karate, somewhat judo, but certainly borrowing highly from karate and from Thai kickboxing and so on. But it is purely, purely a form of training for hand-to-hand -hand combat and self-defense. It's designed to fight when you're outnumbered and surrounded based on the Israeli geo-strategic situation of being surrounded by hostile Islamic neighbors and having to fight when you're outmanned against people who outnumber you and surround you. Well, the Israeli martial arts of an individual is based on the same premise, how to fight multiple opponents when you're surrounded. There's more of them than you, and when they're bigger than you are. Uh, but it has nothing to do with meditation or with Eastern religion. If self-defense can be separated from the meditative practices and the bowing associated with martial arts in, in, in the Far East, from where I just returned. Things like Taekwondo and so forth, or Tai Chi. If you can remove the simple self-defense aspects of those things from the Eastern religious mysticism, there is not a problem with them. I see people out in Hong Kong doing something called Falun Gong. It's cultic and mystical, illegal in China, but you also see people in China out on the pavement in the morning doing Taekwondo, it looks like a ballet dance, it's hard to believe it's a martial art, but they're doing it more for meditative purposes, obviously, than they are self-defense purposes. It takes on a religious or quasi-religious property to it. Christians need to avoid those things. There is a demonic spirit on back of those things, there are some things that take place in the martial arts that can only be attributed to an occult spirit, to a familiar spirit, and Christians need to avoid those things. If a Christian was going to practice a martial art, I would practice one that has no origins in Eastern religion or that was never hijacked by Eastern religion, most notably Krav Maga. Krav Maga is very effective in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In fact, it can be quite deadly. Um, not that we're looking to kill people, but self-defense is not something that Jesus in any way taught against. But this religious aspect with the bowing and the meditation that you see integrated into Taekwondo and into Kung Fu and into the other, many of the other Eastern martial art forms, Christians should not be involved in those things. They should not be involved in those things at all. 
you also see in China people, I was just in Chongqing the week before last, working with, with, with anyway, local believers. And uh, you see them doing Tai Chi, even elderly people doing it. Now, obviously, it has a strong occult association, even though in the West such things are associated more with the martial arts. This is different than yoga. Yoga always had to do with yoking with the yogi. It always had to do with Hinduism and Eastern religious meditation. Yoga was inherently wrong from the beginning, and no Christian in their right mind should practice yoga. Now, stretching exercises are fine, but you don't need Eastern religion and yoga to do that. Yoga is absolutely wrong. Let's go just a little bit further with this. I was in Bad Ning, China one time, some years ago, up by the Great Wall, and there were Westerners going up there to a uh, acupuncture clinic. When you see where acupuncture came from, and you see what it really is, it's not the sanitized version we see in the West. People were buying tablespoons, Westerners, tablespoons of a kind of wine from a jar with six poison species of dead snakes in it and the toxins slowly secreting from the slit underhead area of the serpents into this white wine that was somehow fermented with the snake toxins in it and they were sipping it as an aphrodisiac. You see that acupuncture evolves directly from yin yang, from Taoism. Now if you can look at sympathetic ganglia. If you can look at the peripheral nervous system, the paras parasympathetic nervous system, and just look at it and see concentrations of sympathetic ganglia where insertions take place or where acupressure takes place, you can separate the occult properties of Chinese traditional medicine from that which is legitimately and physiologically sustainable. Let's not forget that modern medical science and pharmacology separated from the healing arts of folk medicine and superstition. Uh, because something was also practiced in the world of superstition does not mean that it does not necessarily have a legitimate scientific basis. The quest is always to take that which is scientific and separate it from its superstitious origins, unpackage it and take it away from the false religious beliefs and the occult practices. These things are obviously wrong, quite wrong. Taoism is obviously quite wrong. Traditional Chinese medicine is quite wrong. But there may be elements of it that have a legitimate anatomical basis if they can be totally separated from it. That would be true in martial arts as well. It is not, however, true in yoga. It is not, however, true in yoga. Stretching exercises existed in other civilizations prior to yoga, and we don't need anything to do with yoga, which is meditative and always based on a relationship with the yogi. Yoga is inherently demonic. Martial arts have become that, but can be extricated from its pagan and occult practices, as can uh, possibly acupressure. But we cannot argue that about yoga. The principal idea is to be separated from Eastern religious idolatry, superstition and occult practices. There is a demonic spirit in those things and practices of Eastern medicine and of martial arts, if not extricated, can lead us into league with something that is demonically influenced. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob, Jacob uh, one follow-up question. Uh, bowing in, in Eastern culture is almost like a handshake but you should never bow before a master's picture. Is there uh, bowing to show a sign of respect? Is that wrong? As a cultural nuance in the West, we can make that argument. The problem is in Hinduism, the bow takes this shape and going like this, and they say namaste. The God and me, meaning Rama, Sitra, Vishnu, bows to the God in you. It has that connotation. Again, Christians should extricate any cultural practice or nuance from anything that has a demonic or pagan or idolatrous association.
Blessings to your friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.